Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I am your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. This episode does contain foul language. It is not suitable for younger listeners. This is episode 16 of season 3 of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was five foot two inches tall, and weighed about 125 pounds. In the five years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful and the facts scarce. We are starting from the beginning, and by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance as we bring to you the findings of our investigation in real time. There are a lot of names that come up in Jessica's disappearance. So many that we know it can make your head spin, despite our best efforts. In episode 15, we started connecting the dots between some of those names, revealing the relationships that tie them together. Those are important connections to establish for many reasons. In that episode, we explained. The bottom line is this. The irrefutable connections between all these groups of people exist, and the connections between them likely include both business and pleasure. We are not stating or even implying that any of these people are responsible for Jessica's disappearance, but we do know their statements to law enforcement contain far more lies than truth. With the puzzling focus of the investigation on Elgin Cochran Road, have these individuals and their lies ever been thoroughly investigated. In that episode, we told you about a woman named Jo Lynn that Jessica talked to on Facebook just hours before she disappeared, and her relationship with Johnny Borden, who grew up with Andre Newell. Andre was married to Alicia Moat's sister, and early in the investigation, an explanation was offered up that Alicia may have told someone where Jessica was staying in retaliation for Jessica having an affair with Andre. We revealed that, based on Facebook records obtained by law enforcement, it would appear that Andre also had something going on with Alicia, his sister-in-law. Andre was questioned in Jessica's case after investigators heard that he had made statements alleging to know something about her disappearance. Similar reports have been credited to JoLynn, too, namely that they were allegedly involved in disposing of Jessica's body. Ironically, our interviews with numerous individuals indicate that JoLynn Murphy and Andre Newell have been close friends or associates for years. 
we've made reference to another person who is rumored to have knowledge or possible involvement in Jessica's case. And that person comes up in at least one other death investigation. That man lived in Russellville and has ties to Joe Lynn and others. And he is currently serving two one-year sentences with the Alabama Department of Corrections in a community corrections program located in Columbiana, Alabama. His name is Ronnie Shane Vandiver, better known as Tank Vandiver. Vandiver's name came up in relation to Jessica fairly early. We related some of the interview Chief Hallmark had with Andre in Episode 9, which occurred about 50 days into the investigation from what we've been able to determine. So, early to mid-March 2018. Prior to interviewing Andre, Hallmark interviewed a witness who claimed Andre told him on two separate occasions that he helped get rid of Jessica's body, and he and another man provided screenshots of messages related to several of the people we are discussing. The content of the messages in the screenshots isn't clear other than they had something to do with the individuals having possible knowledge and or involvement in Jessica's disappearance. We will call the witness Bobby. Here is a piece of his interview transcript with Chief Hallmark and another law enforcement officer with the last name Miller, in which they discussed Andre and a couple other new names. Hallmark. Did he say why he hid the body? Bobby. He didn't say why. He just said he hid it. Miller. Did he say somebody paid him to, or did he know why they did something like that? Bobby. He didn't say why. Miller. He didn't say? Bobby. But Dusty is talking about in a message he's wanting to kill somebody, and he even told his mama that. And Dusty had been hanging out over at the house with him, and he acted like he didn't know him. He thought I knowed him. Hallmark. You think he was serious about saying that? Bobby. About what? Hallmark. Hiding the body. Bobby. I'm pretty sure. Between Brandon Clark, Dusty, Tank, all three of them. We got messages on all three of them. There's no doubt that interview contributed to Chief Hallmark's decision to interview Andre Newell. If you recall, there was very little Andre didn't lie about, but one of the lies he told was that he had no idea who Johnny Borden was. Johnny isn't the only person Andre denied knowing. Here's another short excerpt from the interview of Chief Hallmark's interview with Andre. Hallmark. Okay, well, let me explain why we're here. We got some text messages or some Facebook messages that was sent to the family of Jessica Hamby. In these messages, your name is mentioned in them. You and Dusty Jorner. Do you know Dusty? Andre. I don't know Dusty. I just met Dusty today when he was walking down the sidewalk. That's what I'm saying. I ain't been here long. I've been in Tennessee. Hallmark. You know Shane Vandiver? Andre. Shane? Nuh-uh. Hallmark. The one they call Tank. Andre. I'm, I, I don't know Tank. I don't know Tank. No. Hallmark. You don't know Tank? Andre. Nuh-uh. About a month later, on August 20th, 2018, Jessica's mother added Vandiver on Facebook Messenger and sent the message. Hey, Shane, this is Jessica's mom. 
What's your number so I can call you, dear? Vandiver added Lynn on Messenger 11 and a half hours later, but never responded to her message. Tank Vandiver sounds like a villain from a Jack Reacher novel. He's got a rotten reputation and the looks to match. He's six foot four, nearly 300 pounds, with a bald head that's the same width as his neck, with deep set, squinty eyes that seem to reflect little empathy or remorse. His complexion is pale, with blotches of red, and he has a pronounced scar running from the bridge of his nose to the corner of his mouth on one side. He's the picture of an intimidating character to most, and based on his rap sheet, he's every bit the thug that people think he is. Based on his Facebook communications, he lives on disability, supplemented by selling dope and basically running an illegal pawn shop for stolen goods out of his ramshackle abode. People also seem to think of him as a fixer for their problems, someone they could pay to go beat up a boyfriend or someone that hurt their feelings. In one of those transactions, he knew the person he'd been hired to beat down. He took the job, then messaged the target to get some fake pictures of him lying on the floor looking beaten and unconscious so he could get paid. The records obtained by law enforcement are time-limited, so we aren't entirely sure how that ended. But for a period of time, the girl that hired him was holding out on paying his fee. I do wonder how that ended. At least we can tell you her Facebook indicates that she's still alive. Johnny Borden stated that his girlfriend at the time, JoLynn Murphy, and Shane Tank Vandiver were closely associated. He described Joe Lynn and Tank spending a good bit of time together and said that he first met Tank through Joe Lynn. He even noted that when he and Joe Lynn would get into an argument, she would threaten him by saying she would have Tank hurt him. To be totally clear, Tank's Facebook records are a mess in that Tank appears to allow others to use his account to chat with people. This is evident in some places where a message from Tank's account says, this is so-and-so. Some of the people that messaged his account on a regular basis do the same thing, allowing others to use their account. With a lot of time and studying the records, you can make sense of a lot of the communications and who they are between and can still learn a lot from the messages. There are a few conversation threads that fall into that category that are very interesting. On May 11, 2018, Shane Vandiver sent a man named Brandon Clark a message. He said, I need to talk to my son. He best fucking call me, and he better be fine, too. Tank was in an on-again, off-again relationship with a woman named Lisa Waterman that at least lasted long enough for her to be commonly referred to as Tank's old lady. But in the off times, Tank also had some type of relationship with a woman named Casey Winborn. In the weeks and months after Jessica's disappearance, it appears there was much less of Lisa in Tank's life and a lot more of Casey. It is clear Casey and Brandon Clark had a relationship in the past as well, and this was a regular source of friction between the two men. It appears Casey used Tank's account to message Brandon sometimes. About an hour after Tank sent the message to Brandon about his son, Brandon finally replied. He said, Fuck you, motherfucker. I don't think you know clearly who the fuck you're talking to. 
Brandon also placed a call to him, but the call wasn't answered. So Brandon sent him another message that said, You the killer, bitch. Like you did Jessica. Hell, like Lisa said, she know you did it. To do that to a woman, take one piece of shit of a man. Tank's old lady, Lisa Waterman, was a very familiar name to us in Jessica's investigation because she is the woman that had extensive communications with one of the last people known to be with Jessica, David Shane Reynolds. David and Lisa were in very regular communication on the night of January 2nd and also on the 3rd. Due to these communications and the conversations in which they discussed Shane going to pick her up, law enforcement obtained a search warrant for her Facebook account. Interestingly enough, most of her communications appear to have been deleted since there are conversations with her in other people's records, but all of those conversations are missing from her own records. If these communications between Lisa and David Shane Reynolds aren't enough to connect the Hamilton group to some of the people we are discussing in the Russellville and Phil Campbell area, here's a little more. At least two of the locations that Reynolds visited in Russellville when he turned on his location services in February 2018 were places that Lisa stayed, including the apartment where she stayed with Shane Tank Vandiver. Remember me telling you that Reynolds and Andre Newell had two locations in common in Russellville? One of those places in common was at the apartments where Shane Tank Vandiver lived. About 20 minutes after Brandon sent the message to Tank in which Brandon called him a killer and told him that Lisa said she knew Tank killed Jessica, a reply goes to Brandon from Tank's account. It starts with, Hey Brandon, this is Lisa. It accuses Brandon of being a snitch to the police, and she denies that she told him that Tank was responsible for killing Jessica. Obviously, we don't know if she told Brandon that or not, but I will say this. Brandon isn't the only one that has said Lisa has claimed to have some very detailed knowledge about what happened to Jessica Hamby. Others have come forward with similar but far more detailed stories regarding Waterman. A little less than an hour later, the same thread between Tank and Brandon starts up again. It says, What are you talking about? It's me, Casey. A little more than a day later, Brandon tried to call Tank on Messenger, but the call wasn't answered. Brandon followed the call with a message saying, Look, it's me, Casey, and Brandon. It's about your old lady. She is putting a case on you now. Tank then calls Brandon on Messenger, and they have a short conversation. Presumably, Casey, via Brandon's account, tells Tank, She's been trying to get Brandon. Get them to build a case on you, for real. They have the messages. I'm not playing. Like, she's been wanting them to text about it. I'm not texting about it, so answer now. Oh, my God. You need to talk face-to-face. This is scary. Tank finally replies, saying, Casey, I can't do that shit right now. Check your messenger. I've been texting you. This is a lie they are telling you. There is a thread between Tank's account and Casey's on the same date, but any messages he sent to that account during this time have been deleted. What remains in that thread on that day are messages from Casey indicating her and Tank had some kind of falling out 
and Casey thought he wanted her to get her things and leave. Those messages are followed by Tank begging, Casey, please don't blow this with us. If you want to ride here, we can come now. Be too late later. Won't have the Jeep. And he also sent her, I told you, me and you are together. Not me and Lisa. And everyone knows it. Never let anyone get between us. Casey didn't respond to him. And he sent, Wow, baby, really? I'm here waiting on you. Fifteen hours after Casey said they needed to talk face-to-face via Brandon's account, she replied to Tank from her own account, asking, Is my stuff still there? Tank replied, Of course it is, doll. Why wouldn't it be? As we've read these messages, I've been chanting in my head, yelling for Casey to run. Of course, it's too late for that, but it's hard to read the words she wrote when you already know the ending. Brandon seemed to be concerned for Casey at this time, too. On May 15th, 2018, he messaged Tank again. He said, Dude, I swear to God, if you give Casey anything that could hurt her, I promise you, I will make sure I'll let some of your secrets out. Tank engaged and claimed he had no secrets. The two men argued back and forth, accusing each other of some pretty terrible things. Brandon told Tank that Casey told him she was scared to go back to Tank's place because she was afraid he might kill her. Brandon sent more messages that said, She was telling Dusty how she believes you killed your mom and Jessica. Tank replied that he heard it was Brandon and his mom that killed Jessica. A minute later, Brandon explains to Tank, That was her saying it. I know what happened. Tank sent him another message that said, So see, lots of people lie, huh? I never met that person, but y'all have, huh? Brandon had a strange reply. Nope, it's the one you have surrounding you that you have to worry about. On the same day, Casey used Tank's messenger account, and this time she tried to contact Derek Motes. In a 14-minute time span, she called Derek four times and sent numerous messages to him. The records indicate that her fourth call to him was answered, and they spoke for 125 seconds. Immediately after that call, she sent him a series of messages. She said, Please come get me. It's Casey. I'm at Tank's. I really need to leave here. Please come get me. I really need to get the fuck out of here. Derek never answered her pleas. According to the Times Daily newspaper, the Russellville Police Department received a call from Casey's sister on the night of July 1st, 2018, asking them to do a welfare check on Casey because she had been unable to reach her. Casey's brother-in-law, Derek Todd, offered further details in an interview he did with WHNT News. He told them that they had a trip planned with Casey for the 4th of July holiday. When they were unable to reach her, they drove to her boyfriend Tank's home. Todd said, that Tank was acting nervous and suspicious, and he had scratches on his arm. They left Tank's home and filed the missing persons report with the Russellville Police Department. The next day, Casey's body was found by two city workers in the Old City Landfill, 
off Lawrence Street in Russellville. Her body was found a mere 530 feet from Tank's home, and she had been covered up with debris. The day that Casey was found, Alicia Motes sent some odd messages that, again, someone took screenshots of and they made their way to us. She sent 911 and then some messages filled with typos that are a bit hard to interpret. The best I can say for certain is she told the person they had to talk and crazy shit was happening. She asked the person if they knew Casey Winborn and sent a screenshot of the news story published that day about her body being found. Right after she sent the news story, she messaged them again, saying, I'm fucking scared, dude. Though no charges have been filed, Vandiver is a person of interest in the July 2018 death investigation of 29-year-old Casey Winborn. Casey's family is offering a $3,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest in Casey's death. If you have any information, please contact the Russellville Police Department at 256-332-2230. By July 3rd, Brandon's mother, Lisa Clark, began to make Facebook posts and comments and they were aimed squarely at Tank Vandiver. One of them said, You a sorry piece of shit. You will get yours. That's a promise. You got another one of my girls. It's time to get your cold-hearted piece of shit ass off the street. This was the last draw for you. You a weak-ass bitch. That's all you will ever be. Everyone sees it's only women you hurt. Pray you make it to jail before you get fucked up out here. Better watch every move you make, cause we coming for you, bitch. You will pay for all them. How many times was it in less than a year? We already lost four people. Yeah, it was you, and everyone already knows. Love you, Casey Winborn. Fly high, baby girl. Save me a place by you, baby girl. Promise we will take extra good care of things here. You rest. We got this here. Or should I say, we got him. I promise. Gonna really miss you. By the way, old bitch boy, don't close your eyes. Someone commented on her post and said, I wonder why he never hurt me. Lisa replied, You didn't stay around long enough. I fucking hate him, and I pray the boys beat the brakes off him and make him tell where my other girl is, because he will not get away with either one of them, and to blame my kids, fuck him. He's a weak-ass bitch. Brandon loved that girl. He can say what he want. No one will ever believe his fucked-up lies. He's a cold-hearted piece of shit and deserves to suffer long and hard. To date, it appears that Tank still has his breaks. We've been told that he refuses to sit for questioning about anything without his lawyer present, which is, of course, his right. He also refuses to take a polygraph test. Again, That's his right. It also paints a slightly different impression of the badass reputation of a man that at least once posed for a mugshot like he had just won a rap battle against Eminem. On the same day, another woman made another post about Tank that was full of accusations, and it included photos of him. The original post was deleted at some point, 
but someone else had taken screenshots of it. Those screenshots were posted to Facebook, and the post remained up for almost five years. It had lots of shares and comments, and was one of the first things you'd find if you searched Jessica's name on Facebook. Strangely enough, that post has disappeared in the last few weeks. It said, This is who killed Jessica Hamby, Casey Winborn, Brandy, and Ronnie. I know for a fact, without a doubt in my mind, He's heartless as fuck. Then he posted a status trying to act like he gave a fuck about Casey, but the whole time he knew where she was. They said they got his bloody clothes from vans yesterday, and Casey's blood was on them. Dusty Joyner knows where Jessica Hamby's body is. Someone I know was in jail with Dusty but he couldn't say too much because Tank's son was in there too and could hear him. If the police would have done something when Jessica came up missing, Casey and Ronnie would still be alive. He's making dope with Flocka in it. He gave Brandy a hot shot. He shot Ronnie up in her sleep, and he shot Casey up and left the needle in her arm. He's the fucking devil and needs to be removed from the streets. ASAP. Casey was found dead in the landfill behind his house. It's bullshit he isn't in jail under investigation. The reference in that post to Tank being the devil caught Michael's attention as somewhat ironic. Here's Michael to explain. In Tank's Facebook messages, at one point he tells his son, Praise be to Enlal. Enlal being one part of the Mesopotamian high triad of gods, along with El and Enki. The Mesopotamian pantheon is mentioned throughout the Old Testament and includes the lesser god Baal. A somewhat literal translation of Enlal's name results in him being referred to as the god or lord of wind. But as part of the triad, he held great power and authority and could create and destroy. In one ancient text, he was described as the decreer of fates whose decisions could not be challenged. Another text describes him as the holder of the tablet of destinies and commander of the world. That was a surprising connection to find among Tank's Facebook records. Brandon's mom, Lisa Clark, chimed in on the other woman's post about Tank, and it had even more accusations against Tank. She said, He's not missing yet, and yes, he did it because Casey tried to leave his sorry ass. He shot Ronnie up because he thought she was the one telling about shooting up Brandon Clark and Dusty Joyner in Ronnie's house while they were asleep. He almost killed them. Now Dusty is scared for his life and the piece of shit is still out here running free like nothing has happened. The Ronnie that both women are referring to is Ronnie Rich. At the time of Jessica's disappearance... We believe she lived in Russellville in the town and country trailer park, and we learned some interesting information. According to multiple witnesses, Jessica Hamby stayed with Ronnie for approximately a month around November 2017. Ronnie died on June 7, 2018. We do not know any official details regarding her cause of death, but it appears it was not considered to be suspicious by law enforcement. While we didn't know until recently that Jessica stayed with Ronnie, we were aware of her. According to numerous sources, both Tank and Andre were close to Ronnie, and both are said to have spent a lot of time at her house. 
While we don't have the location data for Tank, we do for Andre, and the data supports that information. We have 855 location points from Andre, and over 30% of them are in the town and country mobile home community. We also know that Dusty stayed or maybe even lived at Ronnie's quite a bit. There's a few things that bother me about Lisa Clark's post regarding Tank. She referred to Jessica as her girl. I can see where Lisa shared some posts on social media about Jessica's disappearance, but I can't find a single post she made about her girl being missing until after Casey Winborn was found dead. So that phrase seems disingenuous and, quite frankly, inappropriate. They were friends on Facebook, and we have no doubt they knew each other, but Lisa didn't send her girl any messages to check on her after news of her disappearance became public, like so many others did. Lisa did share a missing persons post someone made about Jessica to Jessica through Messenger, but she didn't send any comments or messages along with it. There was another person who was also quite vocal on public posts about Casey's death. It was a friend of Casey's who said that just days before her disappearance, Casey expressed she was afraid she was going to be killed by Tank and Brandon Clark. This person publicly commented that immediately after they gave a statement to law enforcement about this, Tank and Lisa Clark began to make threats against them. It was also clear from posts and comments made by some of Casey's family that while they believe Tank was responsible for Casey's death, they think others assisted him, and they've been pretty public in pointing that finger at Lisa and Brandon Clark. But let's go back to January 3rd, 2018, the day that Jessica Hamby disappeared. What does Tank's Facebook reveal at that time? Most of Tank's activity in January was general thug behavior, selling drugs and setting up trade deals for what was likely stolen property. Tank seems to like sports trading cards and comic books a lot, too. So there are conversations about those as well, and we will come back to that soon. The first group of messages that caught our attention are from January 3rd and 4th. Tank talks to multiple people about getting a gun. In particular, he was interested in a 38 special with no serial number, but he also expressed interest in a shotgun that someone had available. Tank has a felony record and is not permitted to have, own, or have access to a firearm under federal law. Russellville PD actually arrested Tank for having possession of a shotgun at one point, and one of the charges that has him in DOC custody right now is for possession of a firearm by a forbidden person, the other being for stolen property first degree. The next conversation that jumped out occurred around midnight on the morning of January 3rd with Dusty Joyner. Tank and Dusty appear to be very good friends, with pages and pages of messages between them in the 1,555 pages of his Facebook activity obtained by law enforcement. There are messages from others asking Tank for favors based on a mutual friendship with Dusty. Dusty sent Tank a message that said, Yo, fixin' to be here. At Vans, I'm waiting on him, fixin' to try to hustle. 
hitting a lick on Van. Obviously, that doesn't seem to have much to do with Jessica or Jeremy, but it's an important conversation when you understand who these people are. The Van he mentioned was an older man named Van Willingham, and this wasn't the only time Dusty mentioned being at or going to Van's residence. On April 13th, Dusty told Tank he was at Van's and to hit him up and sent him a picture of some baseball cards at Van's, telling him that they were on Van's table and he would get them for him. Five days later, another message from Dusty told Tank that he was getting a mower from Van's. In the January 3rd conversation, Dusty indicated to Tank that he was at Willingham's and was waiting on a man he called by a nickname, which we are choosing to conceal for now. That man is well known by that nickname, and he is another name we are pretty familiar with. He lived in the Haleyville area, was considered to have a big stake in the local illegal drug market, and was closely affiliated with the circle that Jeremy Abbott and Jessica had frequent contact with. Jessica Hamby wasn't the only one who was quite scared prior to her disappearance. It appears Jeremy Abbott was too. Numerous witnesses have come forward with information and a couple of them have named this man that Dusty was waiting for. Just days before his disappearance, Jeremy told people he was in trouble with this man and one other man we also won't name at this time. According to these witnesses, Jeremy said he was scared, needed to hide, and he was looking for a ride to Benefield Farm Road to do so. Van Willingham has had a rest in the past for receiving stolen property and other common offenses, but that changed in 2017 when a Franklin County investigation into possession and distribution of child pornography resulted in 15 arrests at Willingham's home. The Times Daily newspaper quoted Franklin County Sheriff Shannon Oliver as saying, they went in looking for child porn, which they found, and they also found more than a dozen people hiding in the house with ice everywhere. Everyone arrested that day was charged with possession of ice methamphetamine. One of those 15 was the man Tank was friends with and had been hired to beat up and he faked the pictures to get paid. Another of the 15 arrested was Casey Winborn. In 2018, Van Willingham was indicted on two counts each of dissemination or display of obscene matter, possession of obscene matter, and production of obscene matter. Willingham was accused of taking images that featured a nude female child and transmitting them. Authorities stated that Willingham was accused of taking the photos of a nine-year-old child at his residence and that the child is now an adult. Willingham was 68 years old at the time of his arrest on these charges. If you look up his mugshots, he was literally and figuratively a nasty old man, yet the messages from the Facebook accounts of these various persons of interest and our interviews indicate that Van's house was the place to be and where many of them spent a whole lot of time. Some of the interviews we've conducted revealed even more alarming information. Witnesses recalled seeing many young prepubescent 
girls being plied with alcohol and drugs and reported hearing their screams as they were assaulted and likely raped. Some of these interviews indicate some of the children were there due to the efforts of at least one of the people we have discussed at length in this podcast. I'm sure the lack of detail here will leave many of you with questions, but that's the most we can publicly reveal without potentially identifying sources of the information, which we aren't going to do. We have ensured that the information was given to an appropriate authority, and it is our understanding that Willingham is not in any condition to be a threat to anyone anymore. The last we checked, the charges for Willingham were still pending, and to date, he has only been accused and has not yet been convicted. As we mentioned, Dusty Joyner frequently stayed with Ronnie, about a mile from Tank, and like we've pointed out, they were pretty solid friends based on their conversations. You'll recall that when Chief Hallmark interviewed Andre, Andre said he didn't know Dusty, that he just met Dusty the day of the interview on the sidewalk. You'll also remember that, like Joe Lynn, Andre repeatedly reminded Hallmark that he didn't live in Alabama, that he'd been in Tennessee. Andre's Facebook location data indicates that he was solely in Alabama after January 3, 2018, including many overnight location points showing he was up and active and in Alabama. This location data puts him in Alabama well before he tried to assure Kenny Hallmark that he was in Tennessee. Tank communicated with Dusty probably more than anyone else, at least in the messages that weren't wiped from his account. There are multiple messages in the file from Tank to Dusty, telling him that the police are looking for him. There's also an interesting incident that took place around January 13th, 2018. Apparently, a post was made stating that Tank had died, that he froze to death in his house. There are other messages around that time indicating that Tank may not have had heat on in his home and that he hadn't eaten for several days and may not have had a working vehicle. On January 13th, there were messages sent from Tank's account to multiple people, one of which was his daughter. They claimed to be from Dusty using Tank's account, and he told her that her dad died. The young woman was initially distraught and appears to have contacted a funeral home and other people trying to find him. She said she wanted to see him one last time. She eventually figured out this wasn't true and that it was some kind of cruel joke, and she wasn't very amused by it. She isn't the only person that received the messages like that from Tank's account, and the targets appeared to be people that Tank had asked for assistance and likely felt didn't help him. After a careful examination of the messages, we are almost certain that Tank sent those messages himself and Dusty had nothing to do with his cruel and sick joke. While it's circumstantial, it is interesting to note that when we mapped out all of the data, Casey Winborn's body was found in an area between Tank's residence and the Greenwood Inn on US-43. We've mentioned the Greenwood Inn before because it has a lot in common with the Haleyville Motel. Across the highway from Greenwood Inn is the Walmart Supercenter. This is the same Walmart that Jessica Hamby worked at and helped Alicia Motes get a job at. From what Jessica's family has told us, the fallout between Jessica and Alicia before 2017 was over Alicia getting caught stealing from that Walmart, which embarrassed Jessica. On January 17, 2018, 
Eric Edwards visited that same Walmart. He was there for about 45 minutes and within the store for about 30 minutes before returning to Hamilton. Not to his house, but to a remote area off US 43, across a field and on the edge of some woods where both he, Alicia, and Shane Reynolds are documented to have spent time. Maybe they like to camp out there? And Eric just needed supplies that the Hamilton Walmart didn't carry? There's a few more connections worth mentioning. Tank communicated extensively with Aaron Motes. Aaron is a relative of Derek and Alicia's, and if you recall, he's the man a woman named Heather said was at the Edwards' home in early January when she saw Jessica's clothes in Eric's Tahoe and found a broken phone stuffed in a seat pocket in the back seat of that vehicle. Heather stated that Eric and Aaron freaked out when she showed them the phone. Tank and Aaron appeared to trade drugs and stolen goods, and their messages prove the two spent time around each other. At the time, Aaron was married, or at least they claimed to be, to a woman named Kalina. Kalina also communicated with Tank. Sadly, Kalina died on December 29, 2019. Her death was ruled an overdose, but her family and others have different beliefs about that. Tank also communicated with Derek Motes. As we said in episode 15, there are connections between Jessica Hamby, Jeremy Abbott, and the people whose names frequently come up in both of their cases. It's not just a matter of them going to the same school, the same rehab, or buying drugs from the same dealers. These are complicated, overlapping social and financial circles between people who at least, to some extent, trusted each other, talked to each other, and interacted with common friends, associates, and maybe even goals. That doesn't equate to involvement necessarily, but they are connections that should be followed. They aren't neat connections like you'd get with someone working a regular nine-to-five job that goes to the golf course or a concert or a bar with a regular group of friends. Sometimes spider webs are symmetrical and they look like art. Sometimes they look like the spider might have a concussion. It's still a web though, and it serves its purpose. There are two primary questions that each of these people need to be asked if it hasn't already happened yet. Where were you the night of January 2nd, 2018 through January 5th? And who can verify that information? The second one, what have you heard over the years from your friends and associates about Jessica's disappearance? Those are the questions we ask over and over. The second one seems to trip a lot of people up. They often reply with, well, it's hearsay. We've heard that more and more since the Johnny Depp trial. Hearsay matters a lot in court, and there are complicated rules governing it during testimony. It's important to keep in mind during an investigation, but it isn't necessarily a showstopper, especially when someone is volunteering for an interview. Even more importantly, when we ask the question, we aren't law enforcement and aren't pursuing a criminal case or even a civil case so far. So we certainly want to hear those answers, including the hearsay, to find Jessica and give her family the answers they deserve. Join us next time as we continue to push for justice for Jessica and Jeremy. (laughs) 
If you have any information that could help to solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby or the death of Jeremy Abbott, please email me at secretscrime at protonmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205 282 0740. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are left still wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have it filled with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we are always adding additional content about Jessica and Jeremy. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All of the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you too are helping us to help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica and Jeremy. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com. Mm-hmm.